events. Now, more about the authors. Kim Johnson is an activist, college administrator, civic engagement leader, and mentor to young Black activists and leaders. She's zooming in today from Oregon. Her debut novel, This Is My America, follows Tracy, a Black teen who is seeking justice for her father's wrongful murder conviction, while also aiming to solve the murder of a white girl, which the town is attempting to pin on her brother. Kim is joined by best-selling middle grade and YA author Nick Stone, whose novels include Dear Martin, Odd One Out, Jackpot, and as just mentioned, Dear Justice, the highly anticipated sequel to Dear Martin, which will be available in late September. She joins us from Atlanta today. So now I turn the, turn the show over to Kim and Nick. Take it away. Hello. Hey. Hi, hey, How friends. are you? Ah, I am just a bundle of excitement and nerves and um, just really filled, actually. You're like mad published now. I just want to. It's real. That out. Can't take like, it back. It's done. It's out there. It's it's a hard cover. You can knock out. You can knock somebody out with it if you need to. Like it's <laughs> it's, it's legit. How does it feel? How are you feeling? It it feels surreal. Um, publishing is just so slow, and so now that it's out there, um, it just it's re it's real. It's you know I was joking earlier that it's like it's mine for this week, and then I'll have to let it go that it's the readers. So <laughs> I am actually glad you recognize that. So we're gonna do this a little differently than I'm sure all of your other events are going to go because like who Good. has done ask the same questions that you're going to yes. hear from everyone else. Um, so instead of talking about inspiration, one thing I want to hear from you is what you felt was missing, right? So when we think about, when I think about books, when I think about creating, for me, I always try to find like, like inspiration for me can come from like a hole that I see. And I know from reading this book that there was a hole that you saw. What was missing that you felt like you could create a thing to kind of plug? To me, it was the thread. Um, you know, a lot of people sort of take apart pieces of issues around racism when we think about our communal justice system as um, single pieces that aren't connected. So it's, it's police brutality or it's just, you know, explicit racism, um, when really it's all tied together. And I, I felt like a lot of the conversations in media, especially when I was, you know, writing this book um, around Black Lives Matter movement, sort of the, the first iteration where it was, you know, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, um, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, um, people were very focused on the, the and obviously so, the physical brutality mm -hmm. of, of what they saw, but, to me, that was a sliver. And, um, you know, working with a lot of young people, you know, they know some of this stuff, but they don't necessarily know where the entrenchment of our criminal justice system comes from and what that can impact a community over the cycle. And so for me, I felt that that was the space, um, you know, all the years of my reading and in schooling and, you know, all that kind of stuff that was looking at these issues. Um, I felt like I could bring something um, to add on to all the other stories that, that were out there and all the other stories that still need to be told. You better do it. <laughs> better do it. You just use the word cycle. And I think, so one of my favorite things about this book is that it does highlight this notion of a cycle, right? So you have this father figure who's incarcerated, and then all of a sudden we have this issue with this father's son. And this is a bit, this kid, this is a kid with a promising future. This is a kid who is headed big places, and suddenly he finds himself. <laughs> I hate using the word entangled considering the kind of right now. It's, it's a word now. <laughs> but, it, but at the same time, like it's the word that really fits the most here. He finds himself entangled in this whole mess, right? This kid finds himself entangled in this whole mess. And this speaks to this cycle because there's so much fear involved that he makes a very specific decision, which just kind of like makes the trouble even more profound. Talk to us a little bit more about this notion of a cycle where you see incarcerated parents who then wind up having children who then wind up incarcerated and then they have children who wind up incarcerated. Talk about that a little bit. 
Yeah, so if you look at, well, you know, often we think about the school to prison pipeline um, mm -hmm. as one way where at a very, very early age, or early as like preschool, probably even earlier than that, about who gets picked on for behavioral things. You see mm -hmm. young young boys and girls um, that are then treated like they're adults and the, you know, just being, walking, um, you know, whoever, whoever they are as a young person gets looked at different. And, and for me, that cycle, it starts so early because it starts as a young person where you might have a behavioral issue that happens in, in the classroom where it's opposed that there's a behavioral thing that you did. Um, and you look at rates of even girls that are six times more mm -hmm. likely, black girls are six times more likely to be, um, you know, in trouble with behavioral issues at higher rates, even for things that are less than their white counterparts are. Um, and the cycle just really, that's that's one piece of the cycle, you know, that it starts. But once you have something on your record, whether it's, whether it's very minor, or even I think the thing that's very prominent now is sort of the, the targeting of um, pulling people over. You know, so, you know, when you get that record that you're pulled over, the next time that someone stops you in front of a store or a park or, you know, being, living, you know, pulled over again, um, then you're looked at as a suspect because you actually have something already there. And that cycle starts and then it starts a recycle because if you look, um, if you look at rates of, of, of uh, in particular men, but it also is with women who have been in prison, uh, mm -hmm. imprisoned, you look at their children at early ages of three, the, um, the, the increase in the amounts of actual social welfare engaging with them at a young age then begins its cycle of another system you know, that repeats itself. And it's, been, it's, it's not just, you know, think about when did it start? And, you know, mm -hmm. my authors and I talk about when you look at slavery, um, you know, it really started with slavery, you know, people, you know, black people running for freedom, um, slave catchers, if you look, slave catchers are, are police, that cycle started there when the, you know, you know, when slaves were freed and we're in, re, you know, reconstruction paddy wagons became, you know, ways to pull people for loitering being. And, and that cycle is just something that, you know, has just continued and you, you, they've used lots of, our country has used lots of crime bills and the war on drugs and sort of all this other coded language that takes away race. When really so much of our system, it's a business. Um, and there's so much investment in, um, in those systems, but you don't look at the same investment in community, whether it's mental health support, counseling support, or just even thinking about, you know, school counselors or how much money do we actually put towards an individual student in a public school versus how much do we put to someone who is in prison. So it's a cycle. I could go deeper, but I'm going to stop. <laughs> Bro, I mean, you, you just took my next question because I was going to ask you about the history because I, I do think about I do think about the history of police and policing and even the, the history of incarceration is something mm -hmm. very fascinating. Um, and that's the thing that you touch on in your book. You, you touch on how easy it is for people, for black people, black men specifically, um, to get kind of caught up in this system and where the whole like innocent until proven guilty Mm -hmm. It ain't really the move. It's more like you're guilty until proven innocent. And I think that that's a thing that you really address head on in This Is My America. What made you want to take on this idea of wrongful incar incarceration? I wanted to open up the conversation because I think that people sort of get stuck in these camps about where they think the problem is. Um, so much of the conversation, if you talk to people and you try to explain to them issues about police brutality or why people are protesting, mm -hmm. there's this thing that this like dog whistle gets that thrown out that like, why aren't you paying attention to what's happening in Chicago? And they use this sort of like gang violence and, you know, people don't care. And so it's sort of as a way to take away the conversation to what we're really talking about and not really connecting that thread again, um, the thread of even that. And, um, and so for me, I, when I read Brian Stevenson's uh, Just Mercy, um, he was able to, to use his, his narrative, his true story, the lives of the people that he worked with to really humanize people that people have actually really forgotten. 
Um, mm -hmm. And I thought that it was so powerful. And there's so there's so many connections when we think about the death penalty in particular, um, because if we if we think about the death penalty, whether or not you agree whether we should have a death penalty or not, if there's a state that has it and someone is on trial for it, we should be a hundred percent sure that they're guilty if we're going if we're going to do that. But if one in nine people are actually exonerated, and if we look at rates of, um, like Louisiana is a really good good example of um, you're 97 percent more likely uh, to be sentenced uh, to the death penalty if the victim is white. And there's just so many other disparities. Um, and so I wanted to sort of like take this take the you know cycle from the very beginning of police brutality all the way to the death penalty in hopes that one people would make the connection of the death penalty is just a modern day lynching and that's something that you know I, I'm, I'm stealing the words from brian stevenson you know he talks mm -hmm. about it so much um it's just it's just taking away a modern day you have you have a room where there are witnesses that people see um someone you know you getting murdered and I, I call it i call i do call it murder um by the state it's state sanctioned um and i wanted people to maybe maybe connect that thread or maybe start to question it but then also think well if we have the death penalty and we actually get that wrong then what happens for very minor incidents? Or what's so common now is looking at, if you're a suspect, there's such a fear to um, not wanting to actually get 10 to 15. Um, so they'll take a plea deal or mm -hmm. not wanting to get 20 to 30. So they'll take a plea deal, even when they're innocent. Um, mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're in the system, um, you will do your time, but then what happens when you're out? Um, and so, you know, I really wanted to have a very broad, picture of this cycle and really kind of, I don't know, not to, you know, puncture the heart of a reader so that yeah. if they, they think about someone who's innocent, then maybe they can start to think about, well, for example, Daddy Greg as a character in my story, um, one of um, Tracy's best friend's father um, who did do something and he, you know, he was incarcerated. But then what does that life look like once he's out and he spent his time? Um, have we just given up on on people, even though they, they, they've done their time? Shouldn't we care about them? And so, you know, I hope that that's what my story really did was it just didn't have people think about one particular issue and then all, all of a sudden there's so much focus on the death penalty, although I think if that's your passion like go for it I you know find your passion and and fight for those things but I, I hope it opens up a conversation and a space for not only talking about it but learning and maybe taking a call to action to do something about it mm. I like you I like you too you you <laughs> came but I mean I, I'm, I'm serious right so like this is your debut novel and you like came out swinging right like you there are no punches pulled this is a book that is very heavy hitting what was that like writing it knowing I mean I'm sure you hoped that this was going to be a published novel yes was this your first was this your first book you'd ever written it's, it was my third book that I've written your third yeah. okay um and what what did it feel like knowing once you had sold it like what was the feeling knowing that like you had sold something that was like we we not but I'm no, playing no here. Shit. I, I love Jenny Han and I loved all the boys I loved before, but like this ain't about sending love letters out and, and all of a sudden you got three boys who want you, right? Like this is yeah. that, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is this is a novel that there's a lot of weight and a lot of grit and a lot of things that you have to grapple with inside of it. What is that like? What's it like having that as a debut novel? Yeah, I mean it's um I think the the first part it's it's overwhelming for that to be the novel because mm -hmm. um you know, when you have a topic, even you just really briefly read the synopsis, you don't know, I think I'm, I'm thinking of black readers, when you see something like that, you don't know what kind of care someone took or, or how did it get translated through the publishing process. And so I think for me, that piece is really hard. It's, it has been hard for me about my peers, um, their thoughts on, on topics like this. Um, but for me, I always just go back to my center of what I'm trying to do and the person mm -hmm. that I am. And, you know, the reason why for me this book was so hard hitting is I feel like the first two novels, it was a passion of storytelling. And it was, you know, it was like, it was cathartic for me to be able to write. Um, and it was like this sort of slice away from the rest of my, my life. But then when I look at the, the work that I do, my work that I do, working in higher ed, it is about access. 
and it's about equity. Like that's what I do every single day. And the kinds of things that my students are involved in, the things that they care about, you know, when they come in, they're about changing the world. And so when I started to think about telling my story, I wanted to throw everything at it. Um, I think I was so frust frustrated too with everything that was happening in the world and feeling like I didn't have the, the kind of space that I could do mm -hmm. something. Um, and so then for me, when it was sort of like looking at my life, I felt like writing was a space that, that I could actually use my, you know, my background that I've had, the, you know, advocacy that I've had, um, and my ability to connect with young people um, in just all the different kinds of ways that I've interacted with them. Um, and I honestly, I'll be like very honest, like when I went on um, submission, I didn't know, I felt like it was, I did too much in the story that people would want to like take away. And I was going through this a long revision process for a year with my agent. Um, and we're, we're trying to think like, should I go, you know, what should I do? And I was like, I want it all because to me yeah. it's the thread. And if there's a, if there's an editor who has a vision of like, oh no, this is too much. Let's do, you know, let's do that. But I really wanted to find an editor that would, would say, you know, let's do it. Like, you know, yeah. like, yes, even if my audience wouldn't be a big audience because maybe people wouldn't get what I was really trying to do. I felt like I was still was going to readers and never did I imagine that I, my book would be coming out in a time period where people are wanting to have conversations on this stuff that people actually are, are, um, I don't want to say more educated because I think that's too, that's yet to be told, but I think mm -hmm. that there are more people aware mm -hmm. and willing to pay, pay more attention and actually own up to say, yeah, I think that there is prejudice that's occurring here. There's something wrong. And oh yeah, Black Lives Matter, where I think five years ago, you wouldn't see, you would, you wouldn't see a bunch of non-Black people saying that. You're right. You're right. There <laughs> is this kind of increased interest in issues that we've been thinking and talking about for a long time, but I'm not going to let, let yeah. my saltiness so yeah, go out. We're not going to, we're going to keep it in tonight because yes. we've done an interview together where I'm like sobbing and wanting to punch somebody in the face. We're not going to do that. Yeah. Tonight, we're not though. doing that tonight. We're not, no, no. Um, That's another day. Quick, right. A another day. Yes. I sign me up. Um, <laughs> a quick word to everyone in the audience, please. If you are interested in asking questions, there is a Q and a box. Drop your questions in there. After this next question that I will be asking, I will be digging into that Q and A box. So let Kim know what you want to know. And if you ask me anything, I'm just gonna throw it to her. So <laughs> be aware of that. So I want to ask you right now. We are both surrounded by Chuck Styles, right? Yes. So the artist for the cover of your book is a black man named Chuck Styles. There's a James Baldwin painting behind your head. That's Chuck. There are two paintings behind my head that are Chuck. Um, the one on this side is uh, Dr. King and Malcolm X posing like Outkast, which is one of my favorite hip hop groups. The Atlanta. Totally show, showing my age, but that's fine. And then on the other side over here is Frederick Douglass, Nelson Mandela, and Marcus Garvey. Art is really, really important. And this isn't like directly, I, mean, I guess it is sort of directly related to the book, but like, why do you think, number one, why do you think art is important? And secondly, how do you use art in your storytelling? And like, how do you use it to bring, to, to bring more awareness to the things that you want people to be more aware of? Yeah. And, you know, we've talked about this too, in terms of how um, literacy and, and the use of literature being, being forms that, you know, sometimes are looked at as the I ideal way to do it. I think for me, it's a form of, ex art is a form of expression. Mm -hmm. And there's so many ways that we do it. And I think specifically within the, the Black community and Black culture, all, you know, across the diaspora, we use vivid imagery, whether that's oral storytelling or dance mm -hmm. or just artistic expression, whether that's her joy or whether that's like to express pain or what, you know, Chuck does, you know, he does, he documents the times and he does it in joyful ways, whether that's pop culture or whether that's looking at some of our historical figures or, um, you know, people like that. And for, so for me, art is, I love art. I love paintings. I love, um, because it's, 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 there's so much to a story that you can do. Um, because mm -hmm. I came into writing later in life, I didn't 
I didn't see myself as a writer. I never thought that it was something that I actually was good at. Um, but expressing myself, like so music to me was a really, really big way in which I actually mm -hmm. feel like I learned to write. Um, Lauren Hill's The Miseducation of Lauren Hill's album, I feel like was a was a letter, like was just a, a series of letters. Um, and so when I write, I write with music. I listen to music. Yeah, I'm at the point now I can listen to music when I write. I think my first book, I couldn't do it, but it sets me in a space of creativity where I feel like my words are jumping off the page. And I think that to me is how I use art in my writing. I'm very symbolic when I write. Um, you know, I, I, I'll talk about things or I have, you know, each of my chapters, it has a, a, a sort of a theme, a name for that particular chapter and I'll use that thread throughout. And I think it's just a way to make writing 3D to me because I think I, like I've lived, right? I, I've lived storytelling via visual, via daydreaming, via music, via, via feeling it like on your, you know, when you read something so good and it's almost like music where you can feel it on your, you know, the goosebumps or whatever. Um, I think that that's, that's what I do with, that's what I, that's what I aspire to do. That's what I always hope that I'm doing. And that's the thing I'm always trying to tap into. It's not just about prose to me. Um, it, you know, it's about, it's about like, how do they, how does it make you feel? Um, and can you picture it in a different way? So. Mm. I hope you're here to stay for a long time. Uh, I need that next book, like next year. Is that a thing or no? <laughs> Yeah, we 2022, like 2022. 2022. Yeah. Here you we, go. I know, full, I've over, full, over more than full time. I'm involved in a ton of different things. It's just, it's, it would be impossible for me to do. I hear that. I hear that. All right. So, um, our beloved shared therapist, therapist, publicist, and clearly <laughs> to me, she is also the therapist. She's also my therapist. Thank you, Kathy. Um, yes. What is your writing process like? Pre-COVID, um, my writing process is, I love, again, thinking in 3D in my writing, is that I have to have a very vivid picture and I have to care passionately about what I'm writing or it has to be so strong with what I'm writing. And um, I love to just free write for like 20,000 words where I don't feel, I, I don't feel, I know. I know the the yeah. plotter in you. <laughs> like my whole soul, twenty thousand words is like all is like three quarters of a book for me. Like that's like two thirds of a book. It's, it's yeah, crazy. and for me, it's just the way to th way to think through because a lot of that is garbage, right? I mean, like a lot of it doesn't is a turning thing. But I feel like I have to because when you write a book, for me because it takes me so long to work through it and revise it, I have to be very passionate. I have to read it just so many times. And so, so that's my writing process. And then, and then I, that's actually where I outline. And now that I'm on, now that I have a, you know, a publisher and we're on like a cycle of different things, I'm much more intentional with thinking through and writing a full synopsis um, mm -hmm. and, and being thematic. I, you know, part of my writing process is it's layered. So, you know, I have the big picture, I write through, I fast draft as, as much as I can. Um, and then I go through a lot of series of rounds of revisions. Um, I, in all my work, I always use, I always use a lot of, <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> I know. My, my, my well, some of us, we all can't calling. be like you. You got six Ooh. books in less than three years. I mean, I you thought today only 30,000 words, Kim, you just spit them out. Like, <laughs> well, I'm too long-winded. I'm, like so, I'm the most long-winded person. These interviews are so hard for me because I'm such a rambler. So I'm super no, long-winded. No, it's great. It makes me yeah. go that fast. And you're, say, you're, you're dropping these like nuggets of, of platinum. So like, keep the count. <laughs> okay. Minus so, the rounds and rounds of revision. We're not doing right. all that. Like you go for it. <laughs> yeah, and for me, for this is my American, even the next book that I'm working on, nonfiction plays a huge role in additional research. And so I find like if I'm if I'm wanting to add a particular layer or theme that I'm I'm just reading a lot. And even if I don't use a lot in my writing, I feel like it informs how I'm doing it. Even if it only informs like less than a paragraph of something that I'm writing about. It might be just because I like to read, <laughs> like to read it's a distra it's a distraction. Um and then, you know, for me as you know, full time 
working all kinds of different things that I'm involved in, um, I have to be actually a very efficient writer when I'm revising. So I spend, you know, I mostly, you know, would write on the weekends where it'd be a couple hours and it would be very efficient and I just would be consistent as much as possible, create a routine. Um, and, you know, if you do it consistently enough, you can get a novel done. And I think that that's something that I know that there's people who are like, oh, I just could never do it. But I think if you're consistent, you know, that's definitely something that you can do. Um, and then music. I like to, I, I'd like to have, you know, a certain kind of music that I really only listen to that's for that particular book. So that because I have to be so efficient, it helps me jump into that creative space so much faster than yeah. trying to like find that sort of like inspiration. So. So with that in mind, here's a really great question. Um, what top five songs would you recommend to listen to while reading This Is My America? Or rather, which song oh. most inspired the writing? Oh, that's such a hard one because I'm like so into my next book. So I don't even remember what I was listening to. I listened to a lot of soundtracks um, for my like intense scenes. Um, you know, I think like Kendrick Lamar, um, I listened to him. I listened to John Wick, that the um, the soundtrack. Um, I like scores. I like movie scores, especially when I'm right. I, I write fast paced stories, and so like there's certain scenes that need to like move to it. Um, I, I think I listened to more uh, more rap when I was writing this particular. Um, hey, turn you know, this, up. <laughs> this particular, but I'm old school, so I don't really. I mean, I use Kendrick Lamar as an example just because he had a song that I felt like sort of like was embodying like Black Lives Matter. But I'm old. I'm old school. I'm like I'm like '90s. That's where. That's like the good rap to me. Just saying. I, look, I feel it. I feel it. Like, yeah, but I, I have to go back to my playlist. That's a that's a that's a good one. Whoever asked that one, I I should um, make a SoundCloud with my my playlist. You should, Spot, or Spotify. like a Spotify playlist. Spotify, yeah. Yeah, because um, yeah, it's 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 been it's interesting. Like people, I love that people are so interested and intrigued by the different pieces of inspiration and like how you are moved to tell the story that you're telling. Um, so yeah, girl, get on, get on that, uh, that playlist. Here's a good one. Uh, oh, 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 we're about to do, hold on. I'm about to do this other one instead. What advice would you give to black kids who are watching society break down around them and who are frankly feeling hopeless, hopeless right now? Uh, your work is necessary and I'm sure profound. Yeah. I mean, I think that the thing for young people, a lot of young people that, um, you know, that, are sort of experiencing everything that's going on is finding something that you're passionate about and that you care about. And that doesn't, and that doesn't actually even have to be activism. It could just be like, if you love music, listen to music. If you love to dance, if you love art, if you love to write, if you, you know, I think it's just so important to find inspiration and enjoy something that you can, you know, feel good about. Um, the other is I think that, you know, young people have so many, new ideas like for a lot of us that are older we've we've tried a lot of stuff our brain is so conditioned it's like it really is psychological yeah um where we've just basically we've already created these these walls these hallways that we sort of like oh we can't go through that door because we've tried that before mm -hmm. and i think with young people their their brain is still developing and i think for for you all we don't all we don't have all the answers because if we did things would be settled um, you know, Ooh. and I think that when you can get to a space as a young person to identify that, you know, your parents or guardians or people around you, you know, they're not perfect. You know, they have, they have faults. And just because they have certain beliefs, being able to just, just to say that they know better as you get older, you'll start to realize that maybe the way that they were thinking and operating worked for them, but times have changed or, um, you know, that it's, it, there's just something new that they can do. And I think for me, a, a lot of what we do in, in writing is we do talk about like using your voice or I, I love what Angie yep. talks about like microphone. I'm like, man, I wish I would have said that. Now I just got sick of voice because I can't take her thing. Um, but I do we think share, so, girl, we share. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, I'm gonna borrow that. But I do, I think it's so important um, 
to do that with the, with what, what we're doing because I think that there's so much in you know empowerment that's there and they can create mm-hmm. their own ideas or again the things that we we that we think are possible whether it's you know you know that the young woman who is in Flint fundraising for stuff um, Marley who's collecting books you know Greta doing environmental stuff the you know the um, Parkland High School mm-hmm. doing using mm-hmm. advocacy. Um, you know, there's, and there's so much technology and social media, like, I can't keep up with that, but, like, they use it in so many unique ways, and I think um, our society has all, America has always had a bloody history, and we, we don't talk about that, and right now, we are seeing chickens come to roost, as as that term says, um, of our bloody history just continuing on, um, and idealism and, you know, it's, you know, thinking about, um, you know, thinking specifically about white supremacy, superiority, even if it, even if it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, Yeah. There's so much of that that's, that's out there. And I think for young people just to, to question it, um, and to change it, I think just because it's our history doesn't mean that we can't go through a space of reconciliation. It doesn't mean we can't go through a space of repairing, or repairing, you know, the wounds that our country has just decided to, like, take the dirt and throw on top of the wounds and put a Band-Aid on it and then think that for some reason it's actually going to heal itself, so. You're just dropping the wisdom, just the nugget, just dropping it. And this is actually kind of a follow-up question. As an educator passionate, passionate about support, Supporting student activists because this is the thing that you do. What advice do you have for uh, for other educators using your book to encourage young student activists? Yeah, I think that I think educators um, not always, and I use the term educator really broadly. I think people think of it just as a you know just teachers, but I do think that there's a lot of people who serve as as educators in a lot of different spaces. And I think that you know if you're working with young people and they're using this book, um, that it's important for for them to actually also show the, the young people that they're working with that they don't have all the answers. I, I'm a strong believer in thinking about growth mindset and, mm-hmm. and not being in sort of a fixed, you know, space. Um, and but we act in, in another again superiority that we actually know it and have it all together. Now we do have knowledge, and that's something that I sometimes challenge. I have a challenge with, um, you know, some of my student activists is that they have so many ideas and they're like, I got this, and then I'm like you got this. And I also like have a little background in it. So let me help you think through this. A little <laughs> bit like, like, I got you. Like, like, you do got it. You know, yeah, also. yeah. I've got, I've had a professional job before, so I kind of know how this works, but you know, let's figure it out together. Um, but you know, you can't, contr- you can't control it. And I always, I, I never really try to control it. And I think some, sometimes my, you know, students, you know, they want me to, um, say exactly what they say and they believe. And that's like how I can support them. And for me, I look at it really different. For me, it's their voice, their belief, if I can help amplify it or move it forward or help them learn about something or give them resources, you know, I'll I'll do that. But a lot of it is their journey. And, um, and I think that for too long, there's been this, this, and we've talked about this before, Nick, this sort of mm-hmm. classical sense about how people learn and what books and text are to use. And you can only use this thing for this particular form. And I think the space of learning, and we're seeing it now that so many people are learning remotely. Um, there's so yep. many ways to learn. And I think that we need to get out of these boxes of, okay, this book, it's now we talk about it because it's Black History Month. And here you've got 28 days to you know figure this out. And, you know, here are the leaders that you're going to learn about. And this is the, the book text that you're going to do. And I think um, I love educators who hand, hand my book to them. And mm-hmm. there's something that's really interesting, or the, the way that the conversation might go, say, for a classroom, for example, is then add additional text based on that. Be nimble, you know. Don't always be so structured with how you're doing it because, you know, there's, there's learning that's happening, you know. And it's that critical thinking um, you know, that's really the space of, of learning for young people that when and if they go to college or even just in, in a work environment, they're expected to figure things out on their own and think for their own. And educators can do that for young people by actually giving them space to do that on their own. Love it. Yes. Like, what else are we here for? Right? Like, right. 
we got to pay all these bills and stuff. Might as well at least try to help y'all do some things. All right. What women of color are sources of inspiration for your art and your politics? Um, I... I, I look at Harriet, I look at, I, so I like to go back because I think it's so important to honor the people who, who were really early on. Harriet Tubman and Ida B. Mm -hmm. Wells, um, who was sort of the, the first person who really would talk about not only just issues about, um, you know, freedom from slavery, but just like women's rights and, and what that means for black women and how much they're out of the conversation. So I've read a lot of just work from them. So that's like sort of going all the way back. But if we look at just, um, you know, Nikki Giovanni, I think poetry is a really beautiful space to think about um, how do you evoke, you know, emotion, um, you know, and thinking through those. Um, you know, Jasmine Ward is someone that I've, I've read a lot. She has just um, just a way to just grip you in a really raw, honest way. Um, and and it always she's always talking about things that, that still feel very present and current. Um, you know, I look at her. Um, oh, I'm trying to. I'm trying, I've been such in the lit world. Um, you know, nothing so wrong long, with that. But yeah. Um, and I look at just like, just like moments of inspiration where what something meant to me at a certain time, like the first time of reading, you know, Alice Walker or Toni Morrison or, oh. you know, just, the, you know, this beautiful work that's been out there um, and, and how to aspire to that, you know, I think how to, you know, they all wrote during a time period that was even harder, you know, to, to get a space. Um, but they did it with just so much integrity. Um, and I think that, that that's actually what inspires me. Um, and I know the question was specific to women of color, but I've been really into James Baldwin. Yeah. Um, he has been, he's actually been the one that I've been really going to and, and reading a lot um, of his work because, you know, he just was constantly documenting the time. He witnessed so much and he talks about bearing witness. Um, and 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 he and his work is always so timely. And in he had he had a hope and a dream for America. And we were able to, as 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 readers, as as people, follow him on this journey throughout his life. Um, and so much of it is so relevant. And for me, I, I hope to leave. Not saying I'm going to be Jane Baldwin because I'm not going to be. But um, I hope to leave a, a legacy where um, people grow with me. You know, I think that we're, we've moved into a society where so much where, you know, you sort of box people up. And I, for me, I just love education. I love learning. I feel like I'm a different person than I was last week. I, I feel like I learned from my mistakes. I learned from my use of language. I'm, I'm constantly learning. And, you know, if I, if I, there's critique on my book and then later I write another book and it's like, you know, wait, that's so different. Um, you know, I think that that's, that's, literature should be able to do that. And so I think that a lot of, you know, women writers I've seen who've had a long history um, have been able to do that. And, and, I, and I hope to do that too. Killing it. I mean, I don't, I, I don't doubt that you, not only don't, I doubt that you will do that. You kind of already are. Um, I know that a lot of people are going to pick this book up and they're going to be very inspired by it. Um, and I say that as a person who writes in a similar vein. There's so much that you accomplish in this book that I really hope people, I don't want even want to say take away, but that they are stimulated by, right? Like there's so much thought provoking material in this book. And so I want to ask you a question from another author whose book will be debuting in early 2021. This is from JL. JL, what's up? Oh look, girl? we got we gonna talk about her because I'm I'm reading <laughs> I'm reading Wings of Ebony right now. And it, I it, am too. Popping, popping. Almost it's done. Popping. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um. So one of my favorite pieces of the story was the push, the push and pull in my heart between Dean and Quincy. So like we won't spoil anything, right? But Jay says she was so torn about who she wanted Tracy to be with and who she thought she should love, and. Jay loved how you intersected those relationships with themes of allyship. Can you talk a bit by talk a bit about why showing both Dean and Quincy in Tracy's life was important? Yeah, I'm so they, with these old tickle <laughs> questions. I know. Um, so, so Quincy and Dean are close friends of Tracy, and um, for me, it was so important to have both because there's 
you know, whether it's film, television, even look, looking at magazines, um, cartoons even that have you know, black girls or black women, um, but in particular literature is that you actually don't often find black girls who are in you know, some kind of um, love interest situation or mm -hmm. they're seen as um, so strong. And Tracy is a strong character. I wanted a, a dynamic, strong character, um, but it, that it's almost like they can they can do it on their own they don't need anyone so they actually don't need a partner and we do that so much to black women at the detriment of black women um and you know i really wanted to have that i i wanted to have that story and you know i think that for some readers who really want to dig into the tough topics um, might find it a distraction, but to me, it's a way of honoring um, Black girls and giving them moments of joy um, that they're more than just one thing. Um, and I, I played around with those relationships because, you know, uh, once she's 17, so she could end up with none of them. I mean, you know, that's, so that's, I mean, uh, that's, certainly you know, not that's, with who I was with at 17. Right. I, I mean, I would, ho I actually would hope not, y'all. Come on. Um, and so I think that that's one thing that people wanted a lot more closure. I think that's one of the things that I've heard re reviewers is they wanted, they wanted to feel really firmly about it. And I think that that's, that's actually exciting because I feel like then I did my job because then yeah. it actually was a character that people cared about and saw themselves in Tracy enough that they would want her to be matched with the person that they felt was like the best fit for her. But, um, you know, her story goes on, you know, off the yeah. page. And for me, I'm a I sure hope so. Like, you yeah, said, she's 17. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a daydreamer. I think about how I want stories to unfold. And I would want a reader to be like, then create the story in your head about what you wanted to do. Um, the other is I really did want to play around with a very close relationship dynamic that dealt with race. Dean is white. Quincy is black. Mm -hmm. um, and and I and I wanted her to think through. I don't think that we often do that en enough for Black girls. That we we actually we we have no problem with Black men being with anyone. You know, it doesn't mm -hmm. you know whatever. Um, but we have some type of we feel some type of way about it with 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 Black girls and even Black girls limiting themselves um, with with the kind of relationships that they want that they think oh. that they're allowed to. And I wanted to address that in in the text and and oh. and I also wanted to have real honest conversations about about race and why sometimes it actually would be really difficult um, to be in a relationship with someone because maybe they don't necessarily get everything about you, but then they have to work to that. And that's, mm -hmm. that to me is the, that, the, the undertone of that being anti-racist, right? To being like, you have to be a voice, Dean, you, you got to talk to your family. You, you know, you need to unpack any bias that you have, but he still can be someone that she loves and cares for and still being in a, in a, in a good relationship. So, um, so I played around with a lot of different themes and it was really important to me to have that there. And I, I, again, I just kept thinking about um, my black readers in particular, who, who want to have a break in the text. They don't need all that, you know, the hard stuff all the time. That's not real. That's not, Back. you know, um, and, and I wanted to have that space. And so if some readers can't necessarily connect to that, that's okay to me because it's, it's for someone else then, you know? Um, yeah. Love it. And I'll ask one more audience question. This one's from Sonia. Sonia runs a podcast actually called Brown Kids Read. Yeah. Wonderful, amazing kid. And I absolutely adore her. So this is a question from her. Do you think that This Is My America is just a book that should stand alone? Or is it a book that you would want to write a sequel for? Good question. I, uh -huh. I, I was like, this is a standalone you know, when I wrote it. And then Ooh, someone I said asked the same thing. And <laughs> I know. Oh, and then Dear Justice coming out in September. Look out for it. Um, yeah, and then and then was as readers started like asking questions or wanting to know more, I did start to think about like, well, what's Tasha's story? Or what was Jamal's story before it happened? And so I, I've never thought about I've never thought about it. I still feel like it's a standalone, but I <laughs> see. I'm just saying, bro, you just never know. Don't close that door. It's all yeah. I'm gonna say. Yeah, that's all I'm gonna say. I'd love to see more from you know a couple people. I'll text you about it. Yeah, text me about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's all. I think. Where? What are we doing? Who's coming back? Either Carolyn or Margaret is coming back to lead us out. 
Hi. Hi. Thank you both so much for such an engaging, insightful conversation. Um, before we close out, can I ask you both what you're currently reading? I know you touched on, on one of um, one of the uh, attendees' books. Um, is there anything else you want to share with us? I am. Um, I'm hoping to finish up. I'm almost all the way done with uh, Christina Hammond's reads, Black Kids. It oh. is it is phenomenal. Um, it, it comes out next week, next Tuesday, August 4th. It's a book about um, it's historical fiction set in the 90s, which is like, doesn't make any sense to me because that's not historical fiction, but I'm, I guess I'm old. Um, and it's, it's set during the time period of Rodney King. And it's, she does such a beautiful job with that journey. Um, I'm about to start right after that book. I'm about to start Legend Born by Tracy Dion. Um, really excited for that. And then... Um, Cemetery Boys by Aiden Thomas. Uh, I've got a, a whole bunch of 2020 debuts that I'm reading. I already have read Nick Stone. Nick Stone, that one lady that I was talking to earlier. Um, <laughs> Ooh, Dare, Just, Dare, Just, Dare Justice. Um, I read that. I'm so looking forward to, um, to that. I think that readers, fans, especially of Dare Martin, are just going to love to see that story. And then the last one I'd say that I'm going to also start very soon is. Um, uh, E.B. Zavoy and um, Yusuf Salem's Punching the Air. Um, really looking forward to, to that book. I think it's going to be super powerful. And I think um, a nice compliment to Dear Justice, This is My America. Combine that with um, Punching the mm -hmm. Air. So create, create your own class discussion with that. Hey, I love it. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, I am reading a book called Wings of Ebony. The author's name is J.L. And... Oh, it's just so good. It's like, it's like the fantasy magic rooted book of my black girl dreams. Um, and I cannot wait for it to drop. I think it's January, 2021. 2021 spring. Early, it's, I think it's, spring, I think it's yeah. January 20. I think it's January, 2021. Jay, pop pop the uh the publishing date into the into the chat. <laughs> so that's how we do it, man. We is. take care of each other, y'all. That's, that's how we do on Zoom. So y'all, you know, check check the chat and the date hopefully will be in there. Um, but yeah, it is it's excellent. And I will say that I have been really excited just seeing how many more. African American debuts there are like this year and next year versus my debut year. So I came, my debut year was 2017. So this is like three years ago. And I think there were four or five of us. It was like me, Angie, Tiff Jackson, EB, Leah. Um, yeah. Yeah, there were like five of us. And and now I'm like, oh, oh, I can have conversations with 20 people. This is amazing. So anyway, keep up the good work, Kim. Thank you. You doing it. And I'm so proud and excited. Thank you. You're welcome. So much. Thanks for those, those great recommendations. Um, and thank you viewers for tuning in tonight. And of course, thank you so much, Kim and Nick for joining us. Uh, just wanna also re remind viewers, you can still click the link to purchase This Is My America, as well as Nick's books. As an independent bookstore, we are so thankful for support from loyal customers like you. You can also check out our website for updated event listings, and you can follow our children and teens department on social media under Kids at Kids and Pros. And I think that wraps up our evening. Thank you again, everyone, for joining and for to, uh, to Kim and, and Nick for, for being here in conversation. We hope to see you again soon. Have a great night. Bye, friends. Bye.